Good morning, everyone. Tractor Man 44 here. Um, in part one, we, we did some uh, basic straight duct layout. And didn't get around to folding anything. But uh, today in part two, we're actually going to get around to uh, running through some of these machines and uh, putting some wrinkles on them and going over to the brake and, and uh, turning all this flat stuff into some half ducts. So come along for a ride, man. It's going to be a little fun. We're actually, the first actual physical machine we're going to use is called a, uh, a lock farmer. Uh, machine which creates a Pittsburgh lock, but it's a lock farmer and it has um, uh, a multi station set of rollers. By multi station, I mean there's five individual stations one, two, three, four, five, and it's got uh, companion, um, uh, companion rollers up on uh, in between because as it begins the formation of the metal, it's got to, to correct it to make it ready for the next step and, and so on and so on and so on. But at any rate, that five station set of rolls actually takes flat sheet metal and creates this kind of a joint right here okay the, the the metal goes in flat and by the time it comes out of the fifth roll it has taken up one inch of material and has folded this little thing right here um, and that becomes the part when the next piece of duct is for, uh, is inserted the quarter inch goes into this right here and then the half of your duct goes over that away and this tab right here is beat over with a hammer to lock everything in place. So this raw piece here turns into a locked piece like that. That locks the other half of the duct inside that groove. That's called a Pittsburgh lock. It's very important that it started squarely into that first uh, leading leading roll. If it doesn't start squarely, it uh, runs off the sheet of metal and ruins it. Okay, there you have it. You got um, six sections of uh, 16 by 8 duct run through the lock farmer and ready to uh, move over to the brake and uh, cross brake fold into your uh, your 90. Uh, half duct and fold a quarter inch uh, lock farmer tab on it and uh, that's uh, six sections ready to go that's uh, four times six what's that 24 foot I feel compelled to uh, expound a little bit on the um, virtues of this particular machine it not only does the Pittsburgh lock on the edge of the duct uh, on the back side of this five set of rolls is a series of rolls that actually form the drive cleat on two and an eighth inch pieces of scrap metal. You set your foot squaring shear uh, set to back gauges for two and a, an eighth inches and pick up all your off all your scrap and stomp it off whatever various lengths you got just use up the scrap at two and an eighth inch by whatever length and stick it in that back slot and out comes the actual drive cleats just exactly like this right here. That's two and one eighth inches right here. And the five rollers on the back half of this. Then another little thing, uh, right up here on the very tip top. You can't really see it. I got too much junk piled on it. Uh, I don't know if anybody really wants to see it, but if they do, just tell me in the comments and I'll clean the machine off and run some stuff through and let you get an idea of what, uh, what, what, what it is. But this up here is an easy edger. Now what it does, if you're making a radius fitting, or an actual round radius fitting, you, uh, you take that easy edger, uh, you cut your radius on it, allowing 3 sixteenths of an inch, and cut your radius out with your snips, and you start this machine up, and you stick that radius right in there, and as, it goes fast too, but as long as you follow that, your, uh, your cut line all the way around, you're going to come up with a 3 sixteenths, 90 degree bend, that will drop right into the uh, Pittsburgh lock that you've actually put on the radius and rolled into your uh, heel wrapper, or in some cases, the toe wrapper. Which, but at any rate, that's kind of neat. Really hard to use Easy Edger. I haven't used that Easy Edger in, I bet, 25 years or so, because it's definitely a little bit on the difficult side, especially on close radiuses. You know, you don't want to make it uh, anything less than oh, 8, 10, 12 inch radius. You know, I'm talking about larger duct. 
that's much easier to use there because you can actually control it and guide it around as that machine's eating it and that machine eats it uh, didn't look all that fast with the, uh, the the duct edges but when you're trying to stay on that 3 16 mark and stay on it accurate because that definitely affects the quality or the aesthetics of the fitting that you're making it goes fast man okay we're gonna fold up a little bit open up the brake Red, do your cross brake all the way from your notch to notch. Just get a little bit of a roll, not too off much. Reverse it just like this. Just a little bit of a roll. Slide into the quarter inch mark. Verify you're on your mark. Roll up to 90. On this old uh, Connecticut brake, it's actually got a protractor over here. You got a gauge right here, then in uh, 15 degrees all the way up to 90 degrees. So I take it just a little bit past 90 because it always wants to spring back. Pop this open, grab this, come right to your notch. You got to double check, make sure it doesn't move. When you move this end, the other end invariably moves again. So that stays dead on, dead on. Come up to 90 degrees, just a little past 90. Right before you take it out of the brake, you can correct it a little bit. Almost all your equipment, like an eight foot brake, it's going to, uh, this half operates independently of that half, or you can, you, when you raise this here, it'll only open it about a little over halfway. If it's a full eight foot sheet, you gotta walk down there and open that also. That opens the apron. But uh, the old brakes that I broke in on years and years ago, it was actually over 100 years old whenever I broke in on it. It was a 100% wooden brake, and the whole apron would raise with one motion. So it was a job to work with. I've got to tell you a story about this old break. You know how they say things have a tendency to go around and, and come back around and all that kind of stuff. There was an old boy in town that um, was a maintenance guy down at our local glass factory. We had a Pittsburgh plate glass uh, manufacturing plant here in town for years and years and years. He was a maintenance man down there and he dabbled with uh, heating and air conditioning on the side and uh, his name was, was Beetle Belly. Beetle, of course, was his nickname, you know, from the famous comic strip and all that stuff. But uh, old Mr. Bailey, he was a good old guy. Um, a lot of guys called him Pockets Bailey because he always wore bib overalls and he kept all of his notes, his little notebooks, uh, in these bib overall pockets where his pockets stuck out about three inches or so. But he had every 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 note you could imagine that he'd ever taken, you know, written in them notepads and, and stuffed in that pocket. But oh, uh, Mr. Bailey, he was, a, he was a buddy of my dad's. And uh, back in the mid-70s, I don't even remember. Yeah, mid-70s, I guess, when I got into air conditioning, uh, I'd had rumblings, you know, that caught it in the wind that that old Mr. Bailey was hadn't been doing any air conditioning work, probably had an old brake he wanted to sell. So I went ahead and went and got a hold of him, talked to him and everything. Went down and took a look at it, and it was in his barn down on his property, which is about uh, five miles from here, actually. And uh, so we made a deal, and I bought it. I hooked, uh, hooked the uh, tag trailer on behind the 1939 Massey Harris 101 Super, my dad's old tractor, and uh, I drove that thing down the road all the way down and backed up to the front end of that door and uh, we winched it right out by hand, just winched it right out of the door on skids right onto the trailer, bound it down, brought it home, and it's been up here ever since. Well, fast forward a whole bunch of years, I forgot to tell you, Beetle's son, were in school with me, had a little bit of a problem with his, with his furnace, so I ended up going down and he picked up a furnace somewhere or whatever. I made a little bit of sheet metal, we stipped him in a new furnace, and on one of the real cold, icy nights and everything, and then, uh, that was just kind of funny because I made the metal on his dad's old brake, and of course he knew that. 
but then again, this past winter, I got a call from my the guy I went to school with, his son, which was old Beetle Bailey's grandson, and uh, because I had helped out his, his dad last winter, he asked if I could kind of help him. He had found on the internet a replacement furnace, cheap, you know, used one, and uh, looking for a bargain. So I went over and said, yeah, that's no big deal. I'll go ahead and whip up some, make, some metal and we'll change it out. So he did all the hard work and everything. I just made up a couple pieces of metal and we swapped that furnace out, let him do all the wiring and the flue pipe and, and all that stuff, you know, let him learn something. He's just a, a young kid, you know, 21, 22, uh, getting out on his own, you know. But at any rate, all said and done, I was talking to him about, uh, about the uh, origination of the machine that I folded his metal on and he was a little bit flabbergasted that uh, it was his grandpa's old uh, old sheet metal brake. And uh, old Beetle Bailey bought this brake brand spanking new in 1959. And I bought it from him in probably the mid 70s, mid to late 70s, I don't know. I'd have to go back and think about it. And actually thinking hurts my head. But at any rate, any of you guys that watch my videos knows that everything ain't all about business. Uh, there's, there's a little monkey business in, you know, in, included. And uh, I kind of like to ramble a little bit, you know. When I ramble, you know, about some of these stories, it gives me time to take a break, you know, because, hey, I am retired, you know. Great. Well, <laughs> that's the story of this old thing right here. This little machine here is called a, uh, a cleat bender. It's a little tight getting the camera over this way, uh, but I don't know if you can see all these fingers through here. It's got uh, different widths of slots uh, and different thicknesses of fingers or different widths of fingers. And that allows you to you uh, get virtually any size duct that you need to fold that drive tab on all the way up to 18 inches. Something's going to line up for virtually every uh, combination of, of uh, duct dimension that you're making up to 18 inch. To the untrained individual, it's a little uh, somewhat of a mystery to get the but it's really quite simple once you fiddle with it. You slide this in here. You got two levers here. You feel it where it's nice and square. You can feel it bump, and then I know I'm square. So you just raise this up, go down and get the second lever, bring it up, drop it out, latch it down, and boom. There's your drive tab right there. In for in the duct. Stick it in here again, bottom it out of course. Raise up the first one, go get the second one, drop it out. There's your perfect drive tab on the other end also. Half section duct is ready to assemble. Again, my shop is not conducive to, uh, <laughs> to doing metal work anymore. You know, hey, I'm retired. I can do what I want. So here you are, 12 half sections of 16 by 8 duct. Um, formed, folded, um, ready for assembly and ready for installation. Uh, here's your 8 inch dimension here, 16 inch dimension over there. Well, I guess I ought to show you that Pittsburgh lock after all that talking about it. You can see right there how it, uh, it takes a full inch of material in order to uh, bend that back right there on the very first bend. It bends it all the way back 180 degrees and then bends it back again another 180 degrees, which gives us this leftover tab out here. Uh, once you drive that one quarter inch 90 down the inside there, you uh, take and drive this tab over uh, this to lock it in place. So I thought maybe I better clarify or at least show a picture of it. There's the 12 half sections and the uh, Pittsburgh's all in a row. Ah, dang, I got so busy in here uh, fiddling around with this sheet metal that uh, I let my fire go out <laughs> Got a little chilly in here and had to put uh, had to put a couple shirts back on. That's okay. It's late enough a day. I think uh, I think the little ladies in there doing some stuff up for the holiday coming up tomorrow. You know, so I got to go in and check anyway and make sure I'm not in the doghouse. But at any rate, uh, we did get to uh, to make a, a few duck halves today, um, and I went ahead and laid out some more straight, got that done, and uh, actually began on some transitions. They'll be coming up in the, in the next part. Again, I don't know how long this is going to drag out. I'm trying to keep the, the, the links of them concise, uh, but I don't know if that's going to work or not. Uh, you know, I have a tendency to get a little long-winded. But at any rate, uh, end of part two, Trackman 44, man, and I'm out of here.